Welcome everyone to our virtual public talk series. Hello, I am Lucinda Offer, Education Outreach and Events Officer at the Royal Astronomical Society, which encourages the study of astronomy, solar system science, and geophysics. I am very much honored to introduce to you our guest speaker today, Professor Louis Dartnell, who will be taking us through millennia of human history and billions of years into our planet's past to tell us the ultimate origin story. Professor Dartnell is an astrobiology researcher based at the University of Westminster, studying how microbial life and signs of its, of its existence might persist on the surface of Mars. He also writes regular science articles in newspapers and magazines and has appeared in TV shows such as BBC Horizon, Wonders of the Universe, and documentaries on National Geographic, Discovery, and History Channels. And both of his books, Origins and The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World After an Apocalypse, are Sunday Times bestsellers. A quick reminder that there will be a Q&A after the talk, so please get your questions ready. There are places to post your questions for our speaker in the Q&A box if you've joined us on Zoom, and thank you for being here, and in the chat box on YouTube where we are also live streaming this public talk. Thank you everyone for being here, and thank you Professor Dartnell for being with us today. On to you. Hello, afternoon everyone. Thank you all very much for uh, virtually dropping by uh, for this talk. My name's Lewis, as you've just heard. I'm a professor at the University of Westminster uh, here in London. And the topic of my research, or at least half of my, my day job, is researching in a relatively new field of science called astrobiology, which is all about looking into the possibility of there being life beyond the Earth. So I've actually come from a biology background and during the course of my PhD and my research career since then, I've learned and, and taught myself a huge amount of planetary science, geology and instrumentation and astronomy and physics. And so what I'm working on now is whether there might be uh, hardy bacterial species, microbial life on the surface of our next door neighbor planet on the surface of Mars. And importantly, if it is there, if Mars ever did offer a habitable environment for microbial life to get started, how could we find it? What biosignatures or signs of life would we most want to look for? And how are they destroyed? How is that signs? How are those signs of life destroyed by the Martian environment, particularly things like the cosmic radiation bombarding the Martian surface from outer space? So if you want to ask about any of that area of stuff, anything about astrobiology and the search for alien life, the search for life, beyond uh, planet Earth, and then please feel very, very welcome to drop questions into the Q&A um, and we can come to them at the end uh, of this talk. Because actually what I want to talk about uh, this lunchtime is on the other half of my career, which is working as a science communicator, doing bits and pieces on radio and TV and working as a science journalist, as a writer and publishing books on different aspects of science. And my most recent book, Origins, is all about how different features of planet Earth have had a huge guiding influence on human history, on determining our story. And this is everything from aspects of the atmosphere and how it circulates around the planet to plate tectonics and continental drift, to where different metal resources and other natural resources are found around the world, and therefore how that has had a defining influence on the development of civilizations and, and their destiny, if you like, how, how they fare relative to each other through history. And what I wanted to do uh, for this lunchtime talk was just pick out two or three of the stories from the entire book, from Origins, that I felt, I thought, were the most profound and interesting when I was researching and writing this book. So I suppose we might as well start right at the beginning of the story with the making of us. How was the earth and planetary processes influential in crafting us as an intelligent species? Now, a huge amount of our evolution, of the development of us as a species, which you can see on the, on the left-hand picture here, this is basically our family tree of the hominins, of the human-like species, as we've diverged and branched away from other apes, uh, such as our common ancestor with the chimpanzees, 
about six, maybe seven million years ago. And over that evolutionary time, we've transformed from hairy, tree-swinging, ape-like creatures to naked, hairless, upright, bipedally walking ape species. There's been huge expanses in our brain capacity and in our intelligence. And we've also become exceedingly proficient tool makers and tool users, as you can see from some of these very early examples of Stone Age technology on the right here. And a huge amount of that story of our evolution and our technological development happened in this part of the planet in East Africa. This is the cradle of humanity. And incidentally, it's also where I spent my own childhood growing up in Nairobi, in Kenya. My, my family was in Nairobi when I was much, much younger. And I went to a school in Nairobi called the Banda, which is Swahili for mud hut. I went to the mud hut school in Nairobi and have some very, very fond memories, spending weekends, driving around the safari parks and the, the grasslands, the savanna landscape, which was ancestral to us as a species. I, I spent my childhood in that environment. So fundamentally, what needed to happen in East Africa, when our ancestors were, were living there, to transform us from being tree-swinging ape-like creatures into humans, you had to dry the landscape. You had to turn rainforest and woodland into dry grassland, into savanna. And this in itself is something of a mystery. If we zoom back out of this focus of, of East Africa. Bear in mind, um, all of the pictures we're looking at here, all of these graphics and satellite views and maps are all graphics I've created myself when I was researching and writing this book, Origins. I became a massive map nerd when I was writing this book. And what you can see in this view here of, of the entire globe, if you allow your eyes to scroll along the midrift of the planet, just gaze along the equator of the Earth, and you'll realize that around the equators where all of the great rainforests of planet Earth are found, that the Amazonian rainforest, the rainforests of Congo and Central Africa, the forests smothering the archipelagos of Indonesia and Southeast Asia, there's rainforest all around the waistband of the planet, except for a weird, tiny little corner of East Africa where it is dry and grassy. And so what drove this process of drying out East Africa while our ancestors were living there was a tectonic process. There's been a huge plume of magma. It's been rising up beneath East Africa, bulging up the skin of the earth, uh, almost like a kind of zit rising up on the face of the earth. And that has thinned out the crust of the planet into eventually it cracked open in this characteristic Y-shaped crack with the um, uh, Red Sea up in one arm, the Gulf of Aden as the other arm of this Y shape, and the third arm is this very long tectonic fracture working its way down through East Africa, known as the Great East African Rift. This is a tectonic crack in the skin of our planet, and it is in that environment that we evolve and adapted as a species. It is the, the towering walls of the rising of, of, the, of the crust and the splitting open through Valley that blocked moisture from either the sea or from the rainforest from blowing over East Africa. And so it dried out the whole area. But this still leaves something of, of a mystery. Plenty of places around the world have dried out and you evolve the camel. So what was special about this particular place where our ancestors were living. And the answer that's been emerging over recent years is that in East Africa over the last three, four million years, there's been a special confluence, a convergence of planetary processes and climactic processes. The landscape of the Rift Valley, which funnels any rain that does fall down onto the valley floor into a particular string of lakes which are very, very sensitive to even small fluctuations in the climate, the amount of rainfall in this part of the world. And wobbles in Earth's climate are driven by the Milankovitch cycles. Small variations 
in Earth's orbit around the sun or the tilt of our, of our axis. And these uh, Milankovitch cycles have created periods in time where the climate was incredibly chaotic. And these lakes along the valley floor, the Rift Valley, would flicker in and out like a loose light bulb, fundamentally changing the environment their ancestors were living in, between wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, changing the amount of vegetation uh, that could grow, the animals that could survive there that we could hunt. So we developed intelligence. We grew a large brain as a solution to a survival problem of an unpredictable environment. We developed our intelligence to outthink a chaotic environment. Now we didn't remain in our cradle of East Africa. Humans, Homo sapiens as a species, has come to disperse and migrate around the entire world. Beginning about 65, maybe 70,000 years ago, the ancestors of every non-African population on the planet left East Africa and then headed along the southern margin of Eurasia and down into Australia, headed across Eurasia up to the northeast of Siberia and across what was known as the Bering Land Bridge so they could reach into the Americas and became the first human species to ever reach the American continent. Other human species like Neanderthals and Homo erectus had spread out around the world but none of our cousins, no other human species had ever reached the Americas. And what enabled this phenomenal dispersal of humanity so that we could become the most widely dispersed human uh, animal species on the planet was that we were dispersing around the world during a very particular period in Earth's climate, during the last great ice age. And this saw huge, thick, ice sheets, kilometers thick across large regions of the Northern Hemisphere and along mountain ranges in the Southern Hemisphere as well. And all the ice drew so much water out of the oceans that sea levels around the planet dropped by over hundred meters and exposed wide areas of the seafloor as dry land. So our ancient ancestors were able to walk between the continents without getting their feet wet. They could cross that Bering land bridge into the Americas. They could cross, cross the Sahul and Sundaland bridges through Southeast Asia and Indonesia down into Australia. And the planetary process that drove first the initiation of this last ice age, but then also the thawing out of the world and the ending of the last ice age was again the Milankovitch cycles. These cosmic cycles in Earth's climate to do with Earth's orbit around the sun or the tilt of our world. And periodically, these uh, three different Milankovitch cycles all fall into sync with each other to make the Earth's climate particularly cold in order to trigger a new ice age. And that was the period when our ancestors were able to disperse around the entire planet. And then with the ending of the last ice age, the thawing out of the world, the sea levels rose again, these land bridges submerged beneath the oceans, the old world and the new world of the Americas became severed and isolated from each other. And these different populations of humanity began experiments in domesticating wild plant species and animals with the beginnings of agriculture and farming, which allowed larger and larger human populations settling into first villages and then towns and then cities and then the emergence of civilization itself. The whole story of human history, the entire period of human civilization falls into a brief little period of a warmer climate, of a respite between the great ice ages of Earth's climate. We are living in an interglacial period which has enabled us to develop agriculture and civilization. Now, I wanted to um, hop forward in this story, not looking at um, human evolution and how we were able to disperse around the planet because of features of uh, the climate change uh, and aspects of plate tectonics, but to look at a later chapter in human history and incidentally, a slightly later chapter 
of the book of Origins, which is to look at the global wind machine, to have uh, to explore how movement not of the ground beneath our feet with plate tectonics, but the movement of the atmosphere high above our heads has had a profound influence in the playing out of human history. And in particular, with the early 1400s and the beginnings of the age of sail or the age of exploration from a European historical point of view. And in this period of history, the, the map that I'm showing here, by the way, it is perhaps slightly confusing because I'm not showing you the terrain of the land masses. I'm showing you the terrain of the sea floor. So the blue areas in this map here that I created are of the North Atlantic. So the area, the big bulging gray on the right hand side is Northwest Africa with Europe above it and the peninsula of Spain and Portugal jutting out into the North Atlantic Ocean. And so looking at the seafloor of the North Atlantic, you can see this ridge, this scar running, running along the face of the earth, which is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That is where the tectonic plates are being forced apart and new oceanic crust is being created uh, still today. And when we're picking up the story here in the early 1400s, Europe was a, a primitive, backwards, ill-educated, um, technologically uh, backwards part of the world. We were right on the limit, right on the extremity, on the outside of this broad, sprawling content of Eurasia. We were far behind other cultures like India or China in many respects. We were the last people to receive the trade goods passing along the backbone of, of Asia, along trade networks like the Silk Roads. And so we weren't just the last people to re receive things like porcelain from China or silk or spice, but everything else that was transported and traveled along these trade routes of ideas and philosophies and religions and knowledge and technology. And so when Europeans started trying to look out into the wider world, we couldn't head back along that route of the Silk Roads towards the east, because by this time in history, there was a powerful Islamic empire, which had come to block the gateway out of Europe towards the east. And so instead, the early Portuguese and Spanish navigators had to look in the opposite direction, out west into the vast expanse, the stormy gulf of the North Atlantic Sea. And the stepping stones that drew these navigators out were archipelagos like the Canary Islands, the Cape Verdes, Madeira. These islands are in fact no more than the very tips of huge submarine volcanoes just poking up above the waves. And in fact, the Azores are volcanoes that are part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And Portuguese navigators followed the way the winds were blowing, the ocean currents were already carrying them south down that northwest coastline of, the, of Africa. But then these sailors hit a problem. If you followed the way that the winds were already blowing, the ocean currents were already taking you, how would you get back home again? You can't simply turn around and go back the way you came because you'd be fighting against the very winds that took you there in the first place. And so the Portuguese realized that the secret to getting home was totally, what must be mind-blowingly uh, novel to them at the time, is to turn away from the coast, turn away from the safety of the land and the landmarks you know how to navigate by and sources of food and water and go further out into the empty ocean until you pick up a different set of winds and ocean currents, which will then take you back the way you came. They completed what the Portuguese called a volta do mar, a return of the seas. And as they headed further down the West African coastline, this huge loop they had to steer to come back, get back to where they came from, took them across the Azores, utterly uninhabited islands. No humans had ever been there before when these uh, Iberian sailors reach there. And so what these Spanish and Portuguese sailors were doing was starting to get their first inkling of the patterns to winds and ocean currents 
around the world. Starting with this little jigsaw piece of the puzzle in the North Atlantic, we've now come to understand the global pattern of winds around the world. And this again comes right back to fundamental planetary science and atmospheric dynamics. Because around the equator, as we've already said, you have a lot of sunshine causing warm, rising air that creates all the rainforests around the equator, but that air rolls over through high altitude, cools down, becomes cold and dense, and sinks back down to the surface of the Earth. And where we have all of that dry descending air at about 30 degrees north and south around the Earth is where we find many of the deserts of the planet. The rainforests and deserts are just consequences of this atmospheric circulation. And the atmosphere has to return back to the equator along the surface of the Earth, and that's just what we call the winds. And the only other fact which is important here is that while the atmosphere is doing these huge convection currents high above our heads, the Earth is rotating beneath its own atmosphere. It creates a Coriolis effect that deflects the winds blowing back towards the equator to one side. So either side of the equator, you have a wide band of winds that always, always blow towards the west. These are the trade winds. And then another cell of atmospheric circulation beyond that turns in the opposite direction. So you get a band of winds that always, always blow in the opposite direction towards the east called the westerlies. You can use these opposing bands of winds like conveyor belts to take you first one way across the entire ocean, sail north a bit to pick up the return leg of the journey and then sail all the way back across the ocean to where you came from by exploiting your knowledge of the patterns of the winds from this atmospheric circulation. And we can see this, this is normally invisible. I'm just looking out the window and this is normally invisible high above our heads. But what I'm showing you here is an incredible uh, satellite view known as the average Earth. I've given the reference to this at the bottom and satellite images of the Earth taken every day of the year have been averaged pixel by pixel. And you can see very clearly on this average Earth, the 30 degrees north band of deserts, the Sahara, the Arabian um, deserts. You can see the band of cloud that often circles the equator, um, which is also where you found the doldrums, areas where there's very unreliable winds around the Earth. You can see the trade winds in this uh, satellite view uh, just off the west coast of Central Africa and South America, that moist wind, moist air from the um, rainforest being blown over the sea in this smear of cloud that you can see. And to link this back to planetary science and astronomy, we see exactly the same process, we believe, going on in the upper cloud decks of the planet Jupiter, where we have the stripy pattern of Jupiter, of the belts and zones being driven by these cells of convection in the Jovian atmosphere, which gives you uh, effectively the equivalent of trade winds and jet streams in Jupiter's atmosphere, where the uh, air is either rising or descending. It, it is a universal feature of rotating planets with atmospheres. But on Earth, uh, these early European navigators learnt how to exploit these planetary winds to stitch together the continents with vast trans-oceanic trade routes in ways that had never happened before in history. The uh, Portuguese found their way all the way south, round the end of Africa and across the Indian Ocean to the source of the spice that they'd been seeking for so many decades of the, uh, the 1400s. And they made a huge amount of money by monopolizing and dominating that spice trade back to Europe. And the only way you can sail around the bottom tip of Africa, following the way that the winds blow you, is by steering such a wide Volta do Mar through the South Atlantic that you stumble in to the continent of South America. The reason that Brazil speaks Portuguese whereas the whole rest of Latin America speaks Spanish, is simply that is the way the winds blew the Portuguese as they were trying to go in the opposite direction towards the east. The Spanish, first with uh, Columbus, of course, uh, discovered North America, a continent that Columbus had <laughs> no expectation of, of being there at all. 
uh, uh, Spanish explorers walked overland across the, the middle of, of uh, North America, the Isthmus of Panama, to become the first European eyes to see a whole new ocean on the far side of the New World, which they called the, the Peaceful Ocean, the Pacific. And then bridging across the Pacific, the Spanish, Spanish established the longest range trade route in the history of sail, which was their Manila galleon route, where they started off uh, on the right hand side of the map here with China, picking up a lot of porcelain and silk and other trade goods, sailing up north to the coast of Japan, where they could pick up the westerly winds that blew them all the way across the Pacific to the coastline of North America in California, headed back down the coast to their silver mines in Mexico, loaded up with a lot of silver coin, and then took the trade winds back across the Pacific to China to create this big loop right across uh, the, the Pacific Ocean. The reason that California was so geopolitically crucial for hundreds and hundreds of years of history, the reason that cities like San Jose and Los Angeles and San Francisco were founded in the first place is that is the only place that you can get to after sailing across the Pacific. That is where the westerly winds deliver you to. Now, the Portuguese discovered a shortcut route across the Indian Ocean, cutting out the Portuguese and coming to dominate the spice trade themselves by exploiting a band of winds in the westerlies in the southern hemisphere known as the Roaring Forties, a band of very, very powerful, very, very fast blowing winds, which form what is effectively a motorway in the ocean. You can, set, you can shave weeks off the crossing to India and the Spice Islands by taking the Brower route, as the Portuguese, or as the Dutch dubbed it. Uh, and the only problem with using this motorway in the ocean of the Brower route is you've got to know when to take your turn off, when to take your junction off the motorway and turn back north up into uh, the Spice Islands. Because if you miss your turning, you plow into the coastline of Australia. And you wouldn't believe the number of shipwrecks littered along the coral reefs of the western coast of Australia, where captains had missed their turning uh, and ploughed into an entire continent. The reason that Cape Town became so important, the reason Afrikaans, a Dutch-based language, is spoken in South Africa, is because before you attempt that long crossing across the Indian Ocean, you've got to uh, provision your ships, fill them with food and water. That's where Cape Town was founded. Australia was discovered by Dutch captains on this Brower route. And then finally, but arguably uh, of greater significance, greatest importance for the subsequent playing out of human history was the North Atlantic Trade Triangle. Now, this was established um, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, where people in Britain and across Northern Europe had worked out how to get machinery to make stuff for us, how to mass produce really useful things like textiles and clothing uh, or weapons. And these manufactured, industrially manufactured goods were then sailed down the old Portuguese route, down the west coast of Africa, where those goods were sold. And with that money, human labor was bought, slaves. People were abducted from their homes in Africa, thrown into chains, boarded forcibly onto ships in the factories and the ports of West Africa, and then sailed along the trade winds route to the colonies in the Americas, where they're forced to work uh, on plantations, growing things like tea and coffee and sugar and cotton. And those raw plant products were sailed back along the Atlantic, along the westerly band winds to North Europe, where things like that raw cotton fiber was transformed into textiles and clothing using our industrialized machinery, which then sailed back down to the coast of West Africa and so on and so on. So this North Atlantic trade triangle was like a giant economic cog sat right across the ocean, being blown round and round by the prevailing winds, by atmospheric circulation and generating colossal profits for its masters, for the slave masters. And so the 
all of this story for hundreds of years of human history, it was atmospheric circulation. It was the prevailing winds and the ocean currents blown around by them that dictated where you had to establish your trade routes to link two places on the world. And that dictated where you had to build your ports to resupply your ships, where your fortresses were built, where cities emerged. It dictated the entire pattern of European colonialism and empire building. And even today, now we have steam ships and are now you know, electric, um, electric vehicles and oil tankers and, and airplanes, still today in the shape of the modern world, we see that distinctive fingerprint of wind patterns descending back from this age of sail and the prime importance of atmospheric circulation. Just to bring you back to our satellite view of the average Earth here, which very nicely visualizes um, that pattern of atmospheric circulation and, and where the winds are found. What I've superimposed onto the satellite image now is some raw data. And again, I've given the, the reference at the bottom of the screen here, um, which originates from an American sea captain in the 1800s who collected huge numbers of ship's logs, which have subsequently been digitized for every single day or several times during the day in this ship's log, uh, the captain would log the latitude and longitude of, of where that ship was. So what you're looking at here in these black lines is uh, almost a million data points of ship locations um, in the age of sail that again really nicely shows the trade routes that are dictated by these wind patterns, following the westerly band of winds across the North Atlantic, for example, or looping through South Atlantic to get beyond the tip of Africa and across the Brower route of the Roaring Forties towards Australia, and then through the Strait of Sunda into the uh, Southeast Asia. Really interestingly, you can also see up um, on the top left of the map here, uh, so off the coast of um, Canada, uh, you can see a lot of ships that are whaling in the, the whaling grounds, the whaling waters um, up in the North Arctic there. But also curiously, a bunch of ships all around the equator that are basically trapped in the doldrums. They're spending days, if not weeks on end, in very light winds of the doldrums, which created by that rising column of air or those convection currents in the atmospheric circulation. Now, I wanted to move on to my, my third and final story from Origins, which is bringing us right up to the modern day. We, we've looked at our origins as a species. We looked at plate tectonics and earth movements and continental drift and the atmospheric circulation high above our heads. Well, I want to look now at how features of our planet dictate even the political, who people choose to vote for in elections. An example we'll look at first is in this part of the Earth, which is the southern states of uh, the US, of, of, of North America. And if we strip off this satellite view and look at now the political view, that the map I'm building up for you here is uh, a county by county political map of the southern states of the, of the USA, which unsurprisingly on the whole is a big C of Republican red. The southern states in America are on the whole a Republican region. But there are some regions, some counties that voted Democrat. And these Democrat voting counties, you, you can see, are not scattered randomly across the southern states. There is a pattern, there is a structure to where people are voting Democrat. There's a big band on either side on the banks of the Mississippi River. That's that, that band going north and south. But also there's this really curious crescent of Democrat voting counties arcing its way right across the southern states. If we peel off that political map and now look at a topological map, looking at the terrain, you can see the Mississippi River course on the left-hand side. You can see on this terrain map the high-altitude red of the Appalachian Mountains uh, up on a slash up the, uh, towards the east there, but nothing on the surface, nothing on the ground corresponds to that crescent of Democrat voting counties. There's no explanation for it, you can see in the landscape. So instead, let's look underground 
at the geology lying beneath our feet. And what I'm showing you here in shades of gray are rocks beneath our feet, which are about 75 million years old. Rocks that were laid down during the Cretaceous period of Earth geological history. And now I'm going to superimpose back on top of that the political map. And you can see this astonishing correspondence between the geological and the political. People chose to vote Democrat in the most recent election, where Donald, uh, sorry, where Biden won, and the previous one, where Donald Trump won. And in fact, looking back across decades and decades in the past, people have chosen to vote for Democrats if they had rocks beneath their feet, which were about 75 million years old. And this makes no sense at all. These people aren't geologists. They're not digging in their backyard going, ah, the rocks I've dated in my backyard, they're 100 million years old. I'm going to have to vote for Trump now or, or vote for Republicans. I wanted to vote for the Democrats, but I can't because the rocks don't allow me. Of course, it's not a direct link. But what we do have is this long line of cause and effect through hundreds of years of human history and then back through millions of years of the planet's history. And what was happening during the Cretaceous era, 75 million years ago, when these particular rocks were being laid down, is that sea levels were very, very high in that period of the Earth's history. The ocean lapped right up through the middle of North America to create a great inland sea. And so the rocks laid down at that time were basically thick sediments of seafloor mud, of sludge, which then became compacted, turned into rock, re-eroded, so it now appears in this particular crescent in North America. And when that rock erodes and creates soil, it gives you a particularly rich, black, fertile soil. A soil that was realized in the mid 19th century, in the 1850s, was particularly good for growing cash crops like cotton. Now, cotton is a very fiddly crop to harvest. It's very handsy. And so unfortunately, in this period of history, cotton cultivation relied on slave labor with people abducted in Africa, taken across that trade winds route across the Atlantic, as we saw earlier in this talk, and forced to work on these cotton plantations. And even hundreds of years later, after the civil war, after the emancipation of slavery, after the civil rights movement, still today, the greatest density of black African-American people live along this crescent of Cretaceous age rocks. People who are much more likely to vote for Democrat ideals rather than Republican promises. And actually what you can see um, in the map here, I've labeled a particular city of Montgomery. And Montgomery is the place where in 1955, a black woman called Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white gentleman on the bus and so the very epicenter of the entire civil rights movement, a movement that transformed the politics and the society of America forever, began right smack in the middle of this band of 75 million year old rocks. There is a long chain of politics going to economics, to agriculture, to soil type, to geology, with one thing leading to the other, going to more and more fundamental reasons behind the patterns that we see in the world today. And just to, to demonstrate, just to prove that I haven't cherry picked the only example around the world, we have such a close correspondence between the planetary and the political. This is a map from our own Fair Isles, uh, from Britain. And on the left, I've shown you uh, a constituency map. I've shown in red uh, constituencies which tend to vote for Labour, in general elections. These are, these are the Labour heartlands in red. And on the right, I've shown you in red the distribution of rocks beneath your feet, which are about 320 million years old. And again, there is an astonishing correspondence between the way people choose to vote, which leader they want for their country, and the geology deep beneath their feet. Now, this particular uh, pattern here is slightly simpler than the American version we looked at. 
And you'll probably be able to work out for yourself what's going on when I tell you that the chapter of Earth's history 320 million years ago was called the Carboniferous. These rock deposits are the coal fields of Britain. It's this flammable rock that we realized we could dig up, throw into our furnaces and into our steam engines to fuel and power the Industrial Revolution, first here in Britain and then across Northern Europe and around the rest of the world. And the final step in this particular line of, line of cause and effect is that the Labour political party grew out of trade unions and in particular coal miner trade unions. So that is that final step in, in the geology and planetary to the political. Now, I haven't had a huge amount of time for this lunchtime talk uh, to go into any other aspects. I've just cherry picked my three most favorite from the book from Origins, but there are plenty of other examples in Origins of these profound, fascinating links between features of the world we live in and human history and why our world looks the way that it does today. Uh, I've given a couple of examples here. This is basically the clickbait of the book. And this is everything from what was the original Brexit about half a million years ago, where Britain became an island, which dominated our historical and military and political history uh, on the island of the British Isles. Uh, why do we eat a bowl of cereal or a slice of toast for breakfast? How has the planet determined even what we choose to eat for breakfast? Uh, or how did Holland, how did the Netherlands uh, and their drowned landscape create the modern financial system? Why was capitalism born in the land of the windmills? And if you want answers to any of those questions, they can be found in the pages of the book that I've written on the subject, uh, Origins, How the Earth Shaped Human History. If any of this has been of interest to you, uh, you can pick up Origins uh, from any online shops or high street shops um, and delve down much further into many, many other uh, fascinating stories of these links between planet Earth and our human story. Um, if you want to read anything about astrobiology and the search for life on other planets, I've written a book called Life in the Universe, A Beginner's Guide. It's very much an introduction, an entry-level book into the hunt for aliens. And I wrote a chapter in a book with Jim Al-Khalili uh, called Aliens, uh, Is Anyone Out There? But these are several of the books uh, that, you can, that you can pick up if any of this uh, subject has been of interest to you. Um, if you are an educator, if you're a teacher, there are, there's a huge amount of educational resources that I've made uh, available uh, absolutely for free on the book's website, which is uh, originsbook.com or teachers.originsbook.com. And you can download any of the graphics or the maps that are created for this book in high resolution, full color for your lessons, uh, for teaching. Uh, there's curriculum links, there's other resources that you can use uh, on that website. So please do feel free to, to jump onto that website and help yourself to anything that you think might be useful. Um, but also completely for free, you can now ask any questions you like of any of the content I've been talking about, uh, about my research in astrobiology, in the search for life on other planets, the, the hunt for microbial life on Mars, or any of the stories I've been telling from my most recent book, Origins, and these deep links between planet Earth and human history. But thank you very much uh, for coming along uh, during your lunch break today. Cheers. Thank you so much, Professor. It was uh, incredibly fascinating, I have to admit. And also, uh, I'm... Uh... I was really excited to hear, oh, San Jose, California. That's actually where I'm born and bred. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so you are because in... of the uh, the western land <laughs> winds across the Pacific. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we do have um, questions coming in on YouTube and the Zoom chat. Please, there is still time to uh, post your questions through to the, 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 the chat box on YouTube, or if you're joining us on Zoom to the Q&A uh, box, please go ahead. Um, very fascinating. You, It's interesting. Actually, I, I have some questions other than noting that uh, you mentioned San Jose, which is really fun for me. Um, this whole political connection to geology, I'm a geology, ge geophysics background, and uh, it's all very interesting and fascinating, especially also coming from a very uh, extreme political climate in the United States. Mm. But I uh, wonder what, what, what made you kind of make this connection or even uh, consider uh, kind of 
being this big, having this being a part of your talk. So um, for that particular story of the link between the Cretaceous rocks in the southern states and the political map of North America, um, that astonishing correspondence was actually first noted by an American geology professor called Stephen Dutch. So, so I referenced him and giving links to his website uh, in Origins, and he, he was the geologist that first noted that. Um, I drew all the maps myself to kind of recreate that correspondence to, to show in, in Origins. But, but that was um, my favourite example from you know, the two, three years that it took me to research and write and edit and then publish Origins. That was one of my standout examples. It just, it just blew my mind of this profound link between, you know, you don't get more sort of temporary and transient than, than elections and, and the, you know, the sort of tides of, of public opinion. And yet even there, even the political map, there are roots down into geological planetary processes um, via things like economics and, and agriculture, as, as I was saying. I, I thought it was um, very interesting. You mentioned, you know, nobody looks down at what, what ground beneath them, but you know, I do. <laughs> I actually, where's the bedrock at, you know, especially, uh, um, you know, if I'm doing any excavation or building of any sort, so yes. <laughs> always look at what's beneath me. Well, of, of course, the foundations that the bedrock yeah. is. Really important. <laughs> um, and there's one of, the, one of the interesting story in the origins, which I really liked, was there's a fundamental difference between London and New York, where New York is the land of skyscrapers because it has close bedrock to the surface. But for geological reasons, I explain, whereas London is basically awful for building skyscrapers because we are in a river valley uh, with very deep mud. So London is perfectly suited for underground tunnels, which is why we have the first metro system, the underground tube, but we are awful for skyscrapers. So even the flavor of a city is determined by things like geology. Very interesting. I mean, and uh, San Francisco, you know, they've already known about their issues um, of building skyscrapers. And of course, they've got a really huge reminder, yeah. a more recent building that is, uh, you know, tilting. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's all very kind of in my mind as a geologist. And it's really interesting you make these other connections to political a good part of your talk that um, obviously inspired people that are online with us now was uh, the wind currents, the the directional currents, and how that uh, created trade routes and such, and uh, and exploration of our planet. So I'm going to start there with a few questions. Um, one from uh, asking, what could be the reason for migration or spreading? in different continents of Homo sapiens? Obviously this question is coming from, you know, kind of humanity as nomads, nomadic, and, mm. um, and moving out from Africa. Yeah, so I showed, I showed this map here. And what maps like this give a false impression of is that this was any way intentional or directional, that our sort of ancient ancestors and in, in, on the brink of Africa kind of furrowed their brows and pointed towards the horizon and marched off to inherit the, the entire earth. And it, it was nothing like this. And in fact, if, if you look at the dates, it took um, you know, tens of thousands of years to get from Northeast Africa and the Arabian Peninsula up to sort of the other end of, of, of Asia, which is an incredibly slow pace of the actual movement of, of people from one year to the next. So what was really happening, this is very much more a dispersal where we were all living as hunter gatherers in this period of our history. And as the population started to increase, people on the edge would just move a bit further away to find a bit more space, to, to find where there's more animals that everyone else isn't trying to hunt at the same time, for example. And then the population would increase there as well. Then people would just migrate a bit further out. So it was this slow diffusion of our ancestors around the world and not really like a sort of directed migration in the way that we had with, for example, the Pilgrim Fathers, the Founding Fathers, deliberately leaving Britain to find religious freedom in the new world of, of America. It wasn't like that in the original dispersal uh, around the world. So it sounds like it was a purposeful, intentional looking for resources and then thriving um, uh, for humanity, for humans moving out. Would that be like the main reason for that? Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense. And I actually have a, um, I have a burning question that I want to ask you. And I'm not sure if now is a good time, uh, but I'll, I'll remind me at the end. Um, so, okay. Um, uh, second question here. What evidence is there for the development of agriculture and uh, civilization prevented the return of the Ice Age? Um, so I think the question then was, what evidence that is there that we prevented? Um, yeah. 
So, sorry, listen, what was the question? What, yeah, what is the evidence for agriculture? The Ice Age. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm guessing, uh, what evidence is there for the development of agriculture and civilization? And then it says prevented the return of the Ice Age, but you're right, it wouldn't prevent the return of the Ice Age. Um, so, I mean, in fact, that there's kind of two very interesting things going on there. It is true that agriculture was invented um, in the current interglacial. So for the vast majority of our species history, we have been based in Africa as hunter-gatherers. About 70,000 years ago, during the last Ice Age, we dispersed around the world, as you can see in this map. And then the Ice Age thawed, and for the first time ever in the history of Homo sapiens as a species, we found ourselves in an interglacial climactic period, not in Africa. We were dispersed around the world. And our response to that was the invention of agriculture, independently several times, several different locations around the world, all independently invented agriculture as a way of feeding ourselves effectively. So in a sense, it was taking advantage of an opportunity presented by the much warmer, but also much more stable climatic conditions of an interglacial period. Um, but interestingly, now that we have gone through the Industrial Revolution and we have become such a powerful force of nature on Earth, that the human industry, human activity, is changing the composition of the entire atmosphere. We are changing the climate of the whole world and making it warmer. But actually some models indicate that we have already postponed the next ice age, that when the Milankovitch cycles next fall into sync with each other and would have triggered, would have initiated an ice age, that will now not happen because the earth is already warmer and there's already too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the next ice age to be triggered by the Milankovitch cycles. And so that is a consequence of uh, human activity and greenhouse gases that we've pumped into the atmosphere. Which, which of course is very relevant to COP26, which is yes. in, in Glasgow. And, yeah, and so coming from that a bit, um, uh, someone asks, when are we heading into the next ice age? And will climate change the course of the weather system so much that uh, affects the future planetary climate trajectory? Possibly. Yeah, so even if we were to um, cease any further greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, it is of course impossible, but let's imagine that we would just stop all emissions tomorrow and go to a completely green, green carbon neutral economy, it would still take well over 100,000 years for the amount of carbon dioxide, the excess carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to be pumped into the atmosphere to, be, to return back to pre-industrial levels by natural processes. To, to be absorbed um, basically by, by a planetary process called the carbonate silicate cycle, which acts to naturally regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the next ice age will be at least another 100,000 years because CO2 levels need to have dropped back down to pre-industrial levels before an ice age could be triggered. We're ironically in a uncharacteristically chilly period of the Earth's global climate history, um, a period which enables uh, ice ages and for the vast majority of Earth's history, it's been much, much warmer than it is right now. There was no ice at uh, the poles for, for large periods of Earth's history. So before we move on back um, to the, the wind climate, the wind change, um, there is a question still here about the human global immigration from um, YouTube. They're just wondering, what's the metric uh, that was used to date this? Was it fossils, archaeology? Um, and they're asking because uh, they've read dates of of humans to Australia, uh, greater than fifty thousand years rather than forty thousand. Yeah, so the the, the date of forty thousand it is kind of confusing on where I put the label because it clearly took ancestors time to cross Australia. Australia is an entire continent, so to reach the bottom tip and based in Tasmania was around forty thousand years ago, but into the very northern margin of Australia was was clearly before that, uh, and dates of sort of fifty thousand years, if not even earlier, um, are talked about for the first arrival of humans and therefore um, indigenous uh, Aborigines in, in Australia um, was a very, very long time ago. Um, it seems like humans migrated pretty quickly across the southern margin of Eurasia and down into Australia, and it was slower for us to get across to the northeast tip of uh, Siberia and then across into the Americas. Obviously, there was a lot of ice in our path uh, during the Ice Age at the time, so we, we kind of had to wait for an opportunity to cross the Bering Land Bridge into Americas, which is why we did that later than arriving in Australia. Great, thank you so much. We um, some questions about the mons uh, possibility of, I guess, the the wind 
the written directions on our planet. Um, one uh, uh, attendee is asking about what about monsoon winds in Indian in the Indian Ocean and then their influence on the trade routes between India, China, and Africa, Arabia. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a great question. So I've talked about the global pattern that is created um, by the convection cells I talked about. But there is one region of the planet where it basically has its own local, its own regional uh, weather system, and that is the Indian Ocean. It's the monsoon system uh, of the Indian Ocean, which is driven, and I explain this in the book, it's driven by basically have a continent sticking itself out into the ocean, which is India. And the cap of the Himalayas at the top of that subcontinent is also hugely influential in uh, making the monsoons much, much more powerful in India than they are in, in other um, continents. And the interesting thing about the monsoon system is that it is seasonal. The direction of the winds reverses back and forth at different times of the year. So the general trick to navigating across the Atlantic and coming home again, for example, is to sail across the trade winds, uh, sail north to pick up the westerly winds and come back again. Or you move your ship spatially to pick up different wind patterns. The trick in the Indian Ocean is a trick of timing instead. You wait for the right moment of the year for the wind direction to reverse anyway, and then take you back again. And when Vasco da Gama first made it into the Indian Ocean, the first European to sail in there, he had no conception of the monsoons or the trick to exploit them properly. And it took him forever to basically back, battle against the wind in the wrong direction to get back to Africa and around again. Um, but uh, Indian sailors and, and Chinese sailors, and it was, a, it was a bustling area of maritime trade before the Europeans ever turned up. They all, of course, understood and had come to understand and come to uh, appreciate the monsoon system um, and that reversal of the winds with time rather than with, with position. Well, there are so many questions coming um, in, so I'm just trying to get through of them. One of them, um, I just passed through, but I'm going to ask this one because it's at the top here. Um, if the geological history of the Earth has influenced human civilization, do you think planetary geology will also influence a similar impact in humanity's future? Yeah, another, another really good question. Um, one thing I didn't have an opportunity to talk about this lunchtime, but there's a whole chapter about it in, in Origins in the book, is where different resources are found around the planet and how that has helped particular states, particular countries. If you have a lot of uh, iron, for example, or a lot of copper during the Bronze Age, or a lot of rare earth elements today, that determines you know, the, the economic potential of different places around the world. And that you would also expect to uh, be true um, on other planets. So people are already talking very seriously about uh, space mining, mining different asteroids for uh, platinum group metals, for gold, uh, perhaps for rare, rare earth elements. Um, if we start colonizing Mars with a permanent human uh, presence, then clearly planetary features are going to be very, very important in supporting those colonies. In particular, where do we get water from? Um, and how do we then convert that water through electrolysis to make oxygen that people can breathe? Where might there be other resources that we can use uh, to live off the land? Something that NASA calls in situ resource utilization or ISRU because NASA loves its acronyms. But these, these are all basically just redescribing what we have done for 10,000 years of human history, of history of civilization, is working out how to make use, how to utilize what we find in the world around us and how to, how to convert it. Um, if, you, if you like that sort of stuff, my previous book, uh, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World After an Apocalypse, um, is a thought experiment book. It pretends that an apocalypse has happened and civilization collapsed and you've survived in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, but it looks at the science and technology you would need to rebuild everything we take for granted in the world today. Could, could you reboot civilization after someone's pushed a great big reset button? And so the knowledge explores these sort of ideas about how do you get metal out of rocks? Um, how do you exploit the natural resources that you can dig up to make an easier and more comfortable life for you? Uh, so you can explore that sort of stuff uh, in the knowledge. Yeah, you kind of touched on my burning question, which is, you know, 
I'm, I'm, I've been a huge Humans to Mars um, and ex, human space exploration uh, advocate for over 20 years now. Um, and uh, that is definitely like that connection to humanity exploring further. And, you know, Paul asked a question, do they follow the water? And that's what working at NASA with Dr. Chris McKay is, hmm. follow the water, will we find life? But I think to end uh, our, our question here, you know, you talked about COP26 and climate change. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here that is very interesting and, and um, kind of apropos for the for the current climate, um, current events. But to what extent is climate change affecting the global wind systems that you so eloquently described to us as Steve? Thank you, Steve, very nice. And also another attendee asked, it would be interesting to superimpose the migration map with the map of temperatures of the globe. Something maybe to think of the future, maybe you already have. Yeah, no, two, two very, uh, very good points. So with climate change, the average temperature of planet Earth is increasing. That doesn't, however, mean that the effects of climate change are uniform. They are very much not uniform. Some places will get uh, much drier. Some places will get much wetter and be subject to uh, more flooding. Some places will be hit by uh, more frequent and more intense storms or hurricanes. Um, so some regions of the world are going to suffer much, much worse than other regions. And, and this has been something that has been hammered home with, with COP26 and low-lying islands basically saying, look, our existence, our very existence is at stake uh, already with, with climate change. So climate change will have a profound effect on the distribution of uh, weather systems and, and rainfall, for example, around the world. And therefore, where people are able to reliably grow enough food to feed themselves with agriculture. And ultimately, what we might start seeing is climate-driven mass migration, as we have seen happen in Earth's history in the past. Um, and I talk about particular episodes uh, involving the steppes and the Huns or Genghis Khan and the Mongols, for example. Um, climate change has driven mass migration in the past, and there is a very good chance it could drive mass migration in our own future um, from anthropogenic climate change. Um, that is a, is a very large, very big concern around that. And the second question was about um, temperature maps and, and migration around the world. And clearly, the world itself was changing uh, from the last glacial maximum to um, it starting to thaw out. And no one was crossing the Bering Land Bridge and, and down the, the North uh, American coastline and the uh, glacial maximum because there was solid ice there. Um, so the dispersal pattern of, of humans around the world um, happened in, in kind of fits and starts. It wasn't all happening uh, uniformly uh, all at the same time. But as I mentioned already, people think that migration happened most rapidly across the southern margin of South of Asia because it was a similar climate to what our ancestors were already familiar with of, of East, East Africa. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Dartnell. I did post the teacher resource uh, link in the chat box. And it's, I was um, very hap happy about uh, that you have teacher resources available for uh, this book and supporting these topics that you discuss. Thank you so much for being with us and, and sharing them with us. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. And have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. And next month, we will have uh, Dr. Olivia Jones from the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. Um, you can look at our future events that are found on our website at res.ac.uk or on our Eventbrite um, page. Um, and uh, Dr. Jones will uh, talk about the upcoming launch of the James Webb Teles Space Telescope, the JWST, and what it has in store for us in learning more about our universe. Thank you all for being with us.